there's two types uh, that I want to talk about. One is the restoration projects uh, or restoring those habitat services. And the other is removal projects that actually go out and remove the mass that's, that's lost. Um, one thing I do want to say about restoration is I don't like the word restoration because restoration has the con connotation that I'm going to put something back the way it was. I'm going to find that baseline and I'm going to put it back the way it was. After an impact, you'll never put it back the way it was. There's always going to be a residual impact. You're going to do your best to bring that, that service back and maybe replace that service, but you're not going to make something look like it never happened. Um, only time will do that. Um, Good restoration projects um, require knowing and understanding the environmental baseline conditions. I think I've said that about 10 times so far, and uh, we've talked about that a number, of, a number of times. And the baseline provides that target for restoration. It tells me what the area was like before the impact, what the habitat type was like, what the density the, of flora and fauna in the area was, what the function, the habitat function is, what was the biodiversity of the area. Um, these things should, should be known um, to some extent. Um, all stakeholders should be involved in the design of a restoration project. Um, it's not suitable to have the, our, the responsible party come in and say, okay, this is what I'm going to do to restore this thing. It has to be a joint process. There has to be transparency. Uh, all voices need to be heard. Um, and you have to consider all the functions in the ecosystem, not just simply um, the, the density of the wetland plants maybe that were were damaged, what was the entire function of the ecosystem. Um, it needs to provide feedback to the engineers because the engineers are going to come and do the design, the actual physical design of the project. Um, so all of the stakeholders need to be able to provide good feedback to the engineers to help design the project. Um, that cooperative nature creates trust amongst everybody, both the NGOs and the local populations and the RP and the agencies. Uh, it bring, really does bring all parties together. I've been involved in a number of these cooperative restoration projects, and they've all come out, um, turned out very well, and they've all turned out with everybody happy and not, you know, one group out there that's, that's upset because they didn't get what they wanted because everybody's been heard through the process. It takes a long time to do that. It takes a long consensus building with a big group, especially um, if it's a big restoration project. It takes a long time to come together, but it can be done. Um, the biggest thing is that restoration projects need to be allowed to succeed. They can't be rushed. You can't replant a mature forest. You, you, the, the, the projects involve replanting vegetation that's often very slow growing. Um, success is measured years after the project has started, not months or days. Um, an example of this is a mangrove restoration. Uh, mangrove forest requires many years of care, um, but it, mangrove restoration can actually produce very strong results. These are, these are photographs. These are not all photographs of the same restoration, so this isn't the before and after pictures, but um, these are just pictures of mangrove restoration projects that have taken place throughout the world. Um, mangroves are fairly easy to plant um, in the, into the mudflats and into the wetlands. Um, they generally take some care, but by the time they grow, you can see that the, the, the plants aren't just left to fend for themselves. They actually take a lot of care. There's, there's stakes to hold the plants up. There's protection devices around there. But when they do work, um, and when you, get the, when you get the growth, you actually can really develop a, a, a big um, uh, restoration uh, piece. And it provides, the mangroves provide really good shoreline protection um, from uh, hurricanes and, and big storms. So it's really important that that, that area, and if, if you've got areas, uh, we heard this morning that uh, uh, areas along the, uh, the Colombian Caribbean coast that have degraded mangroves, I mean, that's a perfect area to think about a mitigation bank. That's a perfect area to really start a focus on, um, on a restoration project because um, they were there once, and you can certainly get them to come back um, with the right mitigation and management processes. Um, planting native vegetation. Um, is required to, to build the biodiversity. Um, there's a lot of different ways to do that. Um, and um, just these, these pictures just show some of the different ways. This, this one picture of the guy in the water here um, is actually planting plants on a floating mat. 
and, and that's going to eventually be a floating, um, floating aquatic plants, but in order to get them started, uh, we put them on a floating mat. Basically, that mat will, will um, decay uh, once the plants grow up, and, uh, and you'll get the floating mat out of there. Um, planting grasslands and planting plants is a tedious business. Um, it takes a lot to get the plants out there. You have to get the plants um, set up, and it, it's a, basically a manual operation. There are very few uh, automated systems that you can get to plant uh, and restore and wetlands or grasslands or forest lands um, out there. Uh, the bottom picture is a, is a beach grass uh, restoration project that's, take, that's taken place in New Jersey. Um, I don't know what the status of that is now after Hurricane Sandy went through, but this was taken before that. Um, but this uh, was an area to try to prevent beach erosion uh, by restoring the dune, the, the dune grasses um, in the particular area. Um, engineering technologies can be used to design uh, effective water channels to really to restore historic flows. Um, this is a project that's, that's down in San Diego, California. Um, it's the San Diego Lagoon. Uh, it's one of the few natural lagoons and natural wetlands. There's about six of them that run along the coast around San Diego. Um, and there are coastal salt marshes that historically have had exits to the ocean. The problem in California with the coastal salt marshes is um, all of this. All of the city that's been built up along the beach, because everybody wants beachfront property, blocked off the, and, and narrowed the mouth of this, this lagoon so much that the effective water flow uh, was such that we didn't get any new fresh water coming in from the ocean. Um, that was really important. So what this project involved was um, developing, replanting some of the wetland here, but also building a new raised bridge that provided better water flow um, through that main channel, building another bridge here, and then building a a large um, aqueduct, essentially, that allowed water flow from the ocean in, into the, the salt marsh. Uh, these coastal salt marshes require uh, seawater to flow into them um, as much as they require water to flow out. So this allowed the tide now to, to start, start working all the way back up in here. And so our, our salt plain, remember the first few slides that we saw talked about where the salinity gradient was in the wetland, and our old salinity gradient was about here, fresh water up to here. Now it's almost past the slide. So we've actually started to put marine water back into the wetland because of that main opening that, that was put in there and a new bridge. So now all the traffic is raised, um, then there's, there's much better water flow and allowing um, communication with the ocean. Um, this is a restoration project in Louisiana. Um, as as we, I showed you before, there's a lot of uh, areas that the wetlands have been, been um, degraded and lost due to erosion. Um, this is, a, is Goose Point in Louisiana. It's, it's uh, on the Alabama side towards, towards uh, New Orleans. Um, and basically what it is is it's become a uh, restoration project where we're taking dredge material from other dredging projects. And remember, I said, there's no, if you've got to have a place to put it, so we're taking clean dredge material and putting it inside this berm that we've built. And what that does is that allows the area that's now open water to start to fill up. Um, and that's kind of what it looks like now after it's been refilled. The next step of this project will be to engineer new channels through the wetlands. So that we're, we're actually modeling natural channels in other parts of the wetland. So we know kind of what the, the, the gradient is, and, and we know what the engineers have designed for the, the, the land gradient out there. And we can design in new natural watercourse channels and then open it up to the ocean and allow that water to start to flow through again and sort of restore this thing back to a, a, a shallow wetland rather than an area that had a two-meter water deep. Yeah. Um, this is Grand, uh, Grand Terra Island in Louisiana. This was one of the island sets that was damaged pretty heavily by Hurricane Katrina. Uh, and it was one of the barrier islands that was uh, hoped to be able to help block some of the oil from Deepwater Horizon uh, as it came up. But because the islands have all been degraded so much by erosion, there's not much island left. Um, so 
what, they've, what the Army Corps of Engineers has done is built these dikes behind the island. And again, we're going to use uh, clean dredge material um, from the area. And before I show you the after, this is the before picture. Before I show you the after picture, these are two dredge chip channels that are probably not even used anymore. But it shows you how much linear channelization was done in these, in these areas just to try to move, move ships around. Um, so they essentially at one point cut right through the middle of that island that was, that was much bigger. But the after picture of this um, is now actually pretty nice. It, it forms a really nice barrier island. Um, and it, it will eventually naturally come back. This one is not going to be replanted. So other than restoration, there's a lot of different removal options. How do you get contaminated mass <clears throat> out of the area? And there's, it's, it's important to sometimes get rid of the, the level of contamination um, if it's too high. Um, in a wetlands, it's primarily done by dredging. Um, so you're going to have to go in and remove mass uh, rather than leave it in there, especially if it's something like it's a, a hydrocarbon that's going to stay there for a long time or something that might be bioaccumulative. Um, dredging can be done in a lot of different ways. Um, hydraulic dredging um, with a, a suction dredge that, that basically is a big tube that goes down in the bottom and stirs up the mud and sucks it out. Um, suction cutter dredges, they're called. Um, that's a very effective way if the, if the mud is soft. Um, dredging with a clamshell or a bucket um, excavator is, is probably the most common method. Um, but disposal can be a problem. What do you do with the contaminated dredge material once it's removed? If there's a big spill, you're going to have to put it somewhere. So um, dredging is not a, a really good option unless you have a, a disposal site that's suitable to put it in there. It's not suitable to just go take it out and dump it in the ocean. Um, it's actually um, against the London Convention, but it's also just moving the mass again back to another part of the ocean. It's much better to be able to put it into a landfill or someplace where you can control it. Um, different types of dredges. Uh, this is a rotary suction dredge. Um, this is the business end. Um, and that just turns around and cuts, cuts the, the, the mud and it sucks it up. Generally, it will store that sediment in the back of, the, uh, of a container. Or there will be a big pump out there and it will pump it through a long, large pipe to the disposal site. Um, this is the old-fashioned way here. This is just an open clamshell. You can see that that just grabs the mud and brings it up. That's very effective for clean material. But you can see that if it's contaminated, um, you get a lot of exposure and sort of loss of the material. So in, in, in you're going to use real, if you're going to dredge contaminated material, you tend to use one of these kind of buckets um, down here. This is called a, a, um, an environmental bucket. Uh, basically, what that does is that seals completely when it closes. And it's got vents on it that will just vent the water out of it. So you're just losing the water. You're not losing a lot of the mud. The, the downside to using those is if there's, if there's debris, they won't close. And if they don't close, then you don't get the advantage of the environmental bucket. Um, this is a, a long arm excavator. Um, it can be used for, for dredging in, in close in on shore. It's also got an environmental um, hydraulically closed bucket on the end of it. Um, and they're using that. That's actually a picture from the Hudson River um, that they're, 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 dred they're dredging right now. And that's a... P that's a <coughs> excuse me, a PCB site. Um, disposal of material at sea is generally forbidden under the London Convention. Um, onshore disposal requires landfills um, or designated disposal sites uh, or land creation projects. The, the, the project on Grand Terra Island is, is a disposal site, essentially, for a large-scale dredging operation of clean material. Sometimes these projects are designed so the bottom layers are the contaminated material, and then it's capped with clean material on top. That's a fairly effective way of, conta of containing the contamination into an area. Um, there are places that still do offshore disposal. Um, and for clean sand, if you're dredging an area that's got a lot of sand, um, there's a lot of places in the United States that use that clean sand on the beach. They just spray it up on the beach to try to add sand back to the beaches where there's been um, um, erosion on the beach. So uh, con general conclusions from, from the processes is that remediation generally takes two forms. 
uh, with both the restoration of lost services and removal of contamination. Um, restoration requires knowing the baseline conditions. Um, it should include all the stakeholders. I can't emphasize that enough. It's very important. Um, they often take long times and they're fairly slow um, before they show success. Um, they, removal projects generally require dredging of some kind of material, or removal of the material in general, um, and require some place to put it. Um, they, can generate to be used for, they can generate good clean sediments for use in beneficial reuse projects like the, the restoration of the islands that we saw here. Um, but it, it is really important to very accurately know the contamination levels of the dredge material you're going to take out before you take it out. 